If you want the short version, Lethal Company is a D&D one-shot now. You can grab the whole game completely free, first link down below. The rest of this video is gonna go into its design and how to run it, so stick around if you're the designated DM of your groups or have no intention to ever play it. Lethal Company is a multiplayer horror game all about searching for junk on abandoned moons in outer space while avoiding a slew of lethal monsters scattered all across the map. The monsters are terrifying, and the layout of the dungeon is a terrifying labyrinth to explore, making for a hilariously horrific experience as you watch all your friends get eaten by sandworms and laugh your cheeks off until you inevitably die yourself. The game won the Better With Friends Steam Award this year, and although it didn't beat Baldur's Gate 3 for the Game of the Year Award, I'm gonna go out on a limb and say it came pretty close. Regardless, to celebrate, I decided to spend a week of my life converting all my favorite parts of the game into a D&D one-shot. It's built for a team of four level 4 characters, and balanced around being a deadly little side quest, great for stocking your party up with a bunch of expensive magic stuff they can pawn off for gold. In an effort to bring a bit of my own creativity in, and to also not completely copy Lethal Company one to one, I toyed around with the lore and monster designs in a way that keeps the same feel of the game while adding to the immersion. If I didn't, then most players would just go, why is there a hideous freak with multiple mouths chasing me around? Why is there a shadow demon lurking around and why does it want to snap my neck? What even is this dungeon? Why am I even here? In the video game specifically, you don't need to know any of the lore to enjoy the core experience, and in a way, not know knowing can also up the horror as you fill in the blanks. But in D&D, most players would call a lack of lore immersion-breaking plot holes, or at the very least, brush it off as another example of the a wizard did it trope. So, rather than force unprepared DMs to pull lore out of their rectums catering to overly curious players, I just went ahead and remastered the entire game. Everything's jumbled up in a way that'll keep veterans of the video game on their toes so they don't break immersion talking about strategies out of character. So let's start from the top and roleplay out how a typical adventure through this dungeon might wind up. An organization has called upon your group for help in investigating a compound on an island three days out at sea. As the original operators have failed to timely respond to the organization's communications, your group has been called to bring the head researcher Sigmund back to the mainland alive or dead. Any valuable items inside have been marked for repossession and are at your group's leisure to take as repayment for the mission. You're told the compound was primarily used to test on dangerous monsters and to keep your wits up in encounter against powerful or intelligent mutants. This quote-unquote organization is basically the company in, you guessed it, Lethal Company. But we're basing this game in high medieval fantasy and keeping things open-ended to let DMs attach any group they want as the ones responsible for the mission. You got a king the party knows? Let him give out the quest. What about some loan sharks that are after Sigmund or the party repaying some debts? Could work too. Once your party's motivated with enough loot and vague threats to take on the quest, you can lead them to the ship they'll be sailing and have them set off. Traveling three days across calm waters, fog begins to roll in and cloud the horizon as you approach the island compound. A massive stone cube of a structure floats precariously by the water's edge, with a murky beachside greeting your boat by the dock. Any existing path to the compound is now seemingly overgrown with a jungle of vegetation. I did my best to fill the environment with a bunch of cool stuff to interact with, and anyone who cares to look around can roll a survival check to find some neat little nuggets of foreshadowing. Number one. One, path to the compound. There's an offbeat path that leads to four dog houses. Bones, weapons, and armors litter the area, and anyone who investigates further can see that it all belonged to the organization that hired them. Basically, the group that hired you all for the job sent people here before and apparently didn't live to tell the tale. Makes a bit more sense why they had to resort to hiring the party now, but I wonder what got to them. We'll find out once the adventure is over, but for now, let's get into the compound and see what's going on. Number two. Two, the main entrance exterior. Once the party gets to the front door, a big weathered poster is there to greet them. Warning! Heavy levels of radiation present within the compound. Wear a protective suit at all times while inside. Do not remain inside the compound for longer than eight hours on any given workday. Do not come into contact with any water flowing under the compound. Automated weaponry is active within the compound. Trespassers will be shot on sight. The signs are meant to help gear the party for a lot of dangers in the compound that won't be immediately obvious or ever explained. For every hour you spend in the place without a suit on, radiation will mess with your DNA in a way that'll slice 10% of your lifespan clean off. Then, to make sure parties aren't cheesing things by taking long rests inside, spending more than 8 hours in the complex has them melting the radiation regardless. Let's, uh, finally go in, though. Number 3, Ventilation Hallway. Just a simple room with a big fan and some hazmat suits hanging on coat racks. It 
It also introduces a lot of features that'll stick around for most of the dungeon. The whole compound is made of stone and metals, doors are swung wide open, and dim yellow lights course through the walls like veins. The ceiling is also a good 13 feet high, giving characters a lot of space for jumping around or for monsters to crawl through. Number 4. Busted Cages A bunch of oddly shaped and sized cages have been broken through in this room. Each one is also decked out with wheels to presumably make it easier to push them around. Anyone investigating can learn that there were three medium-sized omnivores in here through their diet of bananas and beetles, one large carnivore through its diet of fish, and a tall, medium-sized creature that either ate jungle leaves or shed them. There's a steam pressurized door in the back of this room too that can be briefly opened with a super high athletics check, but for now the party's encouraged to go explore somewhere else. Number 5. The Collapsed Hallway This is the first room to show off the massive pits in the dungeon. Basically, the compound was built kinda on top of the ocean, and these pits lead straight down into it. The water is also super irradiated, and will quickly screw up the lifespans of anyone unfortunate enough to fall into it. The metal bridge to the next room has also collapsed, so characters will need to get creative with how they make it over. Strong characters can jump right over, while dexterous ones can jump to the extended beam. Everyone else can be forced to use their spell slots to cheese it in their own ways, and we can move on to... Number 6. The Storage Room Looks like something big trudged through this room, because a bunch of shelves have been pushed out of the way to make room for it. Regardless, there's a bunch of junk in here, and a few random rare consumable items the party can find if they're looking around. This is honestly going to be the easiest loot to snag in the entire dungeon, because monsters are going to make collecting the rest a whole lot more interesting. This room connects to a whole bunch of others too, so let's continue heading west and into number 7, Airlocks. The room ahead is normally blocked off by two big steam powered airlocks. On one side of every one of these airlocks are a bunch of exposed pipes gushing with steam, and breaking one will cause the door next to it to open and a cloud of steam to engulf the area. A room we'll get to later will help the party open and close these doors without wrecking them, but for now they have to either break into the lower door or wade through steam into the upper one. Number 8, The Testing Room Bet you're wondering why the dungeon's been so quiet this far, well wonder no longer. Welcome to the testing room, it's a giant maze-like room designed to test all sorts of monster behaviors. For instance, did you know that whatever monster is hiding inside this room also loves the taste of human flesh? The corpse sitting in the center of the maze sure makes that one obvious. Introducing the shark finned horror. Back in the day, a researcher on the island loved to swim in the water by the compound. Eventually, the radiation got to her, transforming her body into a hideous shark like creature that other researchers began to harass with intrusive studies. When all the monsters of the compound broke loose, though, she got her revenge, and the half eaten corpse in the center of the dungeon is proof of that. This whole room is pitch black, and the horror is fast on her feet, so shining light into her face can disorient her for a bit as you kite her around the maze. Just like in the game too, the horror bumps into walls and slows down as it gives chase, losing half her speed whenever she does. She has the potential of completely chewing through the first character she gets to, or the whole party if they don't figure out how to slow her down. The only loot worth taking in this room too is a key in the dead researcher's pocket, so if a character can snag that without being spotted by the shark finned horror, they can realistically avoid the entire fight. Hey, that's kinda exactly how it works in Lethal Comp- Number 9. Ramp Nothing special about this ramp, in the lore it just made transporting the monster cages from their holding room to the training room easier. Not every room needs to be brimming with adventure, this one's just here to make the dungeon story more cohesive. Anyway, this side of the dungeon's cleared, so let's head east into number 10, the loot bug nest. Probably one of my favorite rooms, this storage room has a small family of bug creatures that will trade loot from their nest with equally sized loot in the party's possession. They got everything from another key the party's gonna need to get into a money room later on, an instruction manual on how to operate a magical device we'll also find later. A bunch of dead people in hazmat suits that were apparently strangled to death, wonder what that's all about, <coughs> more foreshadowing, and a random uncommon magic item that you can decide to just drop in there as well. The bugs are peaceful, but will get agitated if party members try to steal from them. You can also expect to be sliced in half if you get on their nerves too many times, and this whole room can expect to be a half hour 
hour bartering session, or a battle to the death depending on how klepto your party is. Number 11, Turret Hallway. So this hallway connects to all the remaining rooms in the map. Problem is, there's a turret placed to pan around the corner and shoot anything that walks by. I'm always a big fan of turret puzzles in D&D, and Lethal Company just gave me another chance to toy around with them. Watching parties fiddle around trying to obscure the turret's vision, or just beat the thing into the ground is always too much fun. The machine also runs on the same battery that the rest of the building does, meaning if you shut that off, the turret's gonna go with it. The battery's in a different room though, so let's skirt by the gun for now and make our way to number 12, the map room. There's a map carved into the stone tablet in this room that's magically all out of whack. Someone with a bit of arcana expertise can try fixing it, and if they can guess that it's powered with divination magic, they can get a bonus to the roll. The instruction manual in the loot bug nest, or something like detect magic, can make figuring that out pretty easy, but it's also not too hard to guess on its own. Once the map's magic is realigned, it glows with yellow light and shows a bunch of shapes in various parts of the dungeon. Monsters are squares, blue keys are circles, and hazmat suits are triangles. Now, the party might take a look at this map and realize they can guess a few symbols already, but what does the square mean, and why is there one right outside the hallway? A monster, known by the researchers as the Shadow Stalker, has been watching the party since they've entered the compound. And I didn't mention it yet to keep things easy to explain, but it's been making the party's time here a living nightmare. The existence of the Shadow Stalker on the island prompted a research base and ravenous hunt for its capture. Hounds would prowl the island forest, giving endless chase and stressing the Stalker profusely. Eventually, running proved exhausting, and the Stalker willingly trapped itself for capture. The monster however, possessed an ability to teleport through shadows, and would bide its time before escaping its confides, freeing the other caged monstrosities and killing every researcher on the island before the day's end. The Shadow Stalker's revenge towards its confinement still festers as it continues to hunt any foreign entity that visits the compound. The first time a party member tries to backtrack or fiddles around in the map room, the Shadow Stalker peeks out to welcome them, as like a sadistic showing that the hunt has begun. After that, the Shadow Stalker will violently attack party members in vulnerable positions, anyone that spends too long in the map room, or anyone that gets on its nerves. The Stalker fights super conservatively too, so expect it to strangle your backline whenever your party's hands are full, and then run away. Fighting the shark finned horror? There it is! Angered the loot bugs? There it is again! And later on when the power goes out, the Shadow Stalker will have an all-you-can-eat buffet on the remaining party members if it's still alive. Speaking of power going out, number 13. Nuclear Battery. To get into this room, you gotta twist the two blue keys found elsewhere in the dungeon into the doors at the same time. Once you do, the party can read up on some lore about the battery and learn that it sells for nearly a thousand gold pieces. The designated heavyweight champion of the party can unhinge it from the wall and carry it with them. If they don't have proficiency in constitution though, they'll also be poisoned by the thing's radioactive aura, so keep that in mind. And yeah, it's nearly about time to get out of here, but to wrap up the last areas, Room 14 is the break room. Just a cute little place for researchers to eat snacks and keep their stuff. There's a bunch of stale food riddled in the lockers, and an expensive bottle of wine if the party bothers breaking into them all. Then if you wound up doing a full circle like we did in this walkthrough, you can use room number 15 down the hall as an easy way out of the compound. Although the room is simple on the surface, it's strategically placed to cause as many issues as possible for the party. If the group starts the adventure by going across this bridge and up the turret hall, there's there's like nothing to collect or do besides scouting out the area. It'll only wind up wasting their resources having to deal with the turret, so they're encouraged to wrap back around to this room later. The battery also weighs 80 pounds, and the center of the bridge can only support 300, causing the whole thing to collapse and plunge everyone standing on top of it into the radioactive wastewater. And then to add a cherry on top to this horrible situation, if you still haven't killed the Shadow Stalker by this point, it'll appear to suffocate anyone who didn't fall in and drag them away from the party. Assuming the world worst scenario just happened, the rest of the group can quickly pull themselves out of the water, suffer a bit of permanent life loss, mourn the death of their missing friend, and make their way out of the compound. Ah, oh, we did it boys, mission accomplished. Now all we have to do is make it back to the ship.
Cue the blind hounds! As punishment for harassing the Shadow Stalker for so long, the monster got revenge on the hunting dogs by throwing them into the irradiated ocean. Skin melted over their eyes, and their mouths grew to the lengths of a bed frame. The puppers bump into things as they make their presence known, and will violently pounce anything they hear making noise. This shouldn't be a fight if your party picks up on the gimmick fast enough, and is more of a puzzle to see all the cool ways your group tries to hide and distract them. Once you slip away, you can set sail back to the mainland and never talk about this horrific island ever again. As a love letter to Lethal Company and a gift to you all, you can play the adventure completely free down below. My new tabletop book is also dropping on the 15th if you want to support other projects from me. But quite the contrary, I've been Blaine Simple, and I'll see you all in the next video.